الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا سيدنا عبده ورسوله قالوا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدني علما وقال الله تعالى في كتابه العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس قد جاءتكم موعدة من ربكم وشفاء لما في الصدور وهدى ورحمة للمؤمنين قل بفضل الله وبرحمته فبذلك فليفرحوا هو خير مما يجمعون لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم طلب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم ومسلمة أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام الحمد لله الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى has allowed us to come to his house الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى has allowed us to say the كلمة لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to live through another blessed month of Ramadan. We should make shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The month of Ramadan has passed us. The month of Ramadan is the month of Quran, the month of Shifa, the month of forgiveness. But just because the month of Ramadan is over doesn't mean that our striving in the path of Allah should be over. It doesn't mean that we should stop reading the Quran. It doesn't mean that we should stop praying salah. It doesn't mean we should stop giving charity. It doesn't mean we should stop giving zakah. It doesn't mean we should stop anything. In fact, we should increase our a'mal. Because after Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kutiba alaykum as-siyamu kama kutiba ala alladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has prescribed fasting for us as he prescribed fasting to the people before us so that we may attain taqwa, piety so that we may fear Allah more so that we can heed Allah's commands more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say la'allakum he, didn't, he said la'allakum tattaqoon so we can attain piety Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say so we can attain restless nights so we can attain hunger so we can attain thirst Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said so we can attain piety. So with this piety that we have received in the month of Ramadan, after Ramadan, our entire year we should live and we should increase our amal even more than that of Ramadan. Inshallah, today's khutbah, the topic will be about Quran and studying Islam. The Quran is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Qur'an is a gift to the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We might not realize it now, but after we close our eyes, after we are six feet under, after we are in our qabr, we will realize how valuable the Qur'an was. In the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim bismillahi rahman rahim إِنَّا عَرَضْنَا الْأَمَانَةَ عَلَى السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَالْجِبَالِ فَأَبَيْنَ أَنْ يَحْمِلْنَهَا 
فأبين أن يحملنها وأشفقن منها وحملها الإنسان إنه كان ظلوما جهولا Indeed, we have offered the trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, but they declined to bear it and they feared it, but man undertook it. Indeed, he was unjust and ignorant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse is talking about the Qur'an, his Qur'an, his words, his kalam. He says that it was offered to the mountains, but the mountains knew the responsibility of the Qur'an. The heavens knew the responsibility of the Qur'an and they refused it, but we as humans, we have accepted the challenge, we have accepted the burden, we have accepted the responsibility of this Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Hasr, verse 21, And if we had sent down this Qur'an upon a mountain, you would have seen it humbled and coming apart from fear of Allah. And these examples we present to the people that perhaps they will give thought. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you were to send this Qur'an on top of a mountain, if you were to reveal it on top of a mountain, the mountain will crumble in fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of the power of the Qur'an. The Qur'an, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said about the Qur'an, the Qur'an is the greatest intercessor. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in a hadith, the Qur'an is such an intercessor that his intercession will be upheld in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever puts the Qur'an in front of him, it will lead him to paradise. Whoever puts the Qur'an behind him, it will, lead him, it will steer him to the hellfire. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also said, Siyam in Qur'an will intercede for the servant on the day of judgment. Fasting will say, to his Lord, I stopped him from his food and pleasures in the day. And the Quran will say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I stopped him from sleep at night. Let me intercede for him. And they will, allow, they will be allowed to intercede. This Quran is a trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to us as a favor. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explains, and every ummah, certainly there is a source of pride. There is a source of there is something which people of the ummah, they take pride in. And the source of my pride in my ummah is the Qur'an. Nowadays, we think that dignity and status lies in attaining materialistic things. Who has the best houses? Who has the best cars? How many degrees we have? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa saying, the pride of my ummah is the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down his Qur'an. This is the kalam of Allah. This is the word of Allah. Do we know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is? Do we know his qudrat? Do we know his power? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a creator. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, هُوَ اللَّهُ الَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ الملك, القدوس, السلام, المؤمن, المهيمن. So many names, so many titles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do we know his power, we do not understand his power, my dear respected brothers and sisters. One of, just one of his qualities, one of the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-musawwir. Al-musawwir means the maker or the fastener or the shaper of beauty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything unique in this world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything unique in this world. There are Seven billion people on this world, on this earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created every single individual unique. Every single individual has their own face. Every single individual has their own qualities. Every single individual has a different thumbprint. Every single individual has a different eye structure. Every single individual is unique. Every single individual, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him specially for himself. Even the trees, we see the trees, no two leaves of the same tree are identical. Each one has a different pattern of the same tree. There are, over, there are millions and millions of trees in this world and plants, and each leaf is unique. Each, unique, each leaf has its own unique qualities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who can do this, my dear respected brothers. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Zumar, verse 62, Allahu khaliku kulli shay'in wa huwa ala kulli shay'in wakeel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the creator of all things. Khaliku kulli shay'in. He created all shay. Shay is everything we can think of, everything we can see or not, everything we can perceive or not, everything that is in the realms of human comprehension or not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Kahf, chapter 118, verse 109. قُلْ لَوْ كَانَ الْبَحْرُ مِدَادًا لِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّي لَنَفِدَ الْبَحْرُ قَبْلَ أَنْ تَنْفَدَ كَلِمَاتُ رَبِّي وَلَوْ جِئْنَا بِمِثْلِهِ مَدَدًا If the sea were ink for writing the words of my Lord, the sea would be exhausted before the words of my Lord were exhausted. Even if we brought like it, even if we brought the like of it as a supplement. And one hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, if all the trees would be turned into pens, and all the oceans would be turned into ink, and we start, we gather the creation from the beginning of Adam alayhi salam to the end of time, and they started writing the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They started writing all the bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them. The trees would finish, the oceans would finish. And he says in the hadith, and you can add another seven oceans, and another seven earths, and you can continue to write about the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, the trees would finish, and the oceans would finish, but the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot even be comprehended. And Surah Mulk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتٍ طِبَاقًا مَا تَرَى فِي خَلْقِ الرَّحْمَانِ مِنْ تَفَاوْتِ فَارْجِعِ الْبَصَرَ هَلْ تَرَى مِنْ فُتُورِ and who created the seven heavens in layers? You do not see in the creation of the most merciful any inconsistency. So return your vision to the sky. Do you see any breaks? And then return your vision twice again. Your vision will return to you humbled while it is fatigued. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, look how perfect my creation is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I created the seven heavens and the earth one on top of, the, one on top of each other. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is challenging us in this verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, look at my creation. Look to see if you can find any rifts. Look to see if you can find any breaks. Look to see if you can find any mistakes in my creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then tells us, you will not be able to find any mistakes in my creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us again, then look again and look again. Your sight will return to you humiliated. Your sight will return to you worn out. Your sight, your sight will return to you fatigued, tired. So this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent his Qur'an. He's so powerful and his Qur'an is powerful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a separate qutbah by itself. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent us the Qur'an. This is the Qur'an, the book of guidance. The book in wherein there is no doubt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Baqarah, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا للمتقين. This is the book wherein there is no doubt. This is guidance for those who are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not addressing any crazy people, any majnoon, any jahil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing us. He is telling us this is the book wherein there is no doubt. This is a book for those who are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a book of true promises and sure threats. This is a book of nur in the darkness. This is a book of shifa. This is a book of cure for our inner sicknesses. I quoted the ayah in the beginning. Ya ayyuhal nasu qad jaatkum maw'idatum min rabbikum wa shifa lima fi sudur. This is the book of healing for the disease of ignorance, for the disease of doubt, for the disease of hypocrisy, for the disease of differences. This is a book of cure for our hearts. Narrated one hadith, narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the hearts get rusted as iron gets rusted with water. And someone asked Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what could cleanse hearts again? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, frequent remembrance of death and the recitation of the Quran. This will remove the rust from our hearts. The Quran 
has so many virtues in it. The Quran, as I stated in the beginning, the Prophet wasallam said, the Quran is an intercessor, such an intercessor whose intercession will be upheld in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever puts it in front of him, it will lead him to Jannah. Whoever puts him behind him, it will steer him to hellfire. Most of us, many of us, cannot recite the Quran properly, much less understand it. We have to make an effort to learn the Quran. We have to make an effort to understand it. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in famous hadith, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَهُ The best amongst you is the one who learns the Quran and teaches it to others. There is no better way in spending our time than reciting the Quran or learning the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says himself, whoever was kept busy with the recitation of the Quran and, and so much so that he couldn't ask of me, he couldn't make dua to me because he was so busy in the Quran and the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will give him better. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising. I will give him better than those who I give. Who, I will give him better than those who ask of me. The scholars, they gave a brief explanation. They were saying like a person at a party or at a function, after the meals, it is time to pass out the sweets. And the person who is passing out the, street, the sweets, the distributor himself, he himself sets out a portion for the distributor of the sweets. Most of the time it's the best portion because of the sacrifice the person is going through to pass out the sweets. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the chest which does not have any Quran in it is like that of an abandoned house. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gave us so many, virt so many opportunities to get blessings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his treasure is spread out and he's saying, take from my treasures. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we read from the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in a famous hadith, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, the famous hadith about Alif Lam Mim. He says, I am not saying that Alif Lam Mim is one letter, but Alif is one letter, Lam is one letter, and Mim is one letter. And each, whenever a person recites one letter of the Quran, his virtues of that letter, his deeds is multiplied ten times. So by saying these three, only Alif Lam Mim when we recite the Quran, we already receive thirty blessings. The Quran has so much barak in it, so much barakah that even, even if you say the word shaitan in the Quran, even if you say iblis in the Quran, even if you say jahannam in the Quran, even if you say nar in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will still, still give you reward for saying that in the Quran. One example the ulama gave about learning the Quran, the ulama gave the example, if you were to attain all the continents, all the wealth inside the continents, everything you see in this world, if you were to attain it, but in the end, you will die. Everything will belong to someone else. Kullu nafsin maut. Every soul shall taste death. Whatever riches you have, whatever money you have, whatever cars you have, everything in the end, when you die, it will belong to someone else. But even one ayah, one ayah of the Quran, this reward is everlasting. It's like if someone gives you a dollar, and this dollar, they give it to you on the conditions that you don't have to pay anybody back. It's free dollar. You don't have to give them, you don't have to recompensate for that dollar. It's better than if someone gives you $1,000 as an amana and a trust and telling you, you cannot spend any of this. You have to save it for me. When I come back, I'll take it from you. In fact, the person who has the $1,000, he will feel insecure. He will feel he will feel insecure, he will feel perishan, that what if I lose this dollar? But that person who has that one dollar, he will be more happy. If we have this realization in our hearts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a creator, he created us. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ He has not created us, except, he has not created man and jinn, except for his worship. Once we have this realization into our hearts, picking up the Quran will not be easy. Trying to learn the Quran will not, picking up the Quran will be easy, sorry. Picking up the Quran will be easy. Trying to learn, trying to understand the Quran, it will be easy. It will not become a burden for us. Once this reality, this haqiqat comes into our lives, everything will become easy, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the Quran a means of shifa and intercession for us and not an opponent and proof against us, inshallah.
we should try to we should try to strive and learn the Quran and also Islam as well. And the next khutbah will discuss the benefits of seeking knowledge of Deen in Islam, as opposed as opposed to immersing ourselves solely for this dunya. Inshallah. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Nahmadu, and a Sarinu, when a self in who and Ominu be he, when a Tawakal Ali, when I would be la him in Shuruni and Fusina, women say at Yamalina, May Yadilla Fala Mudilla, Wamay Yudil who Fala had Yella, when I shadow Allah, Ila, Illa, who are the Hula Shari Kala, when I shadow and Muhammad and Abdu who were a Sulu. قال الله عز وجل في كتابه العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أفما يعلم أنما أزل إليك من ربك الحق كمن هو عما إنما يتذكر أول الألباب أفمن هو قانت على أفمن هو قانت أنا الليل ساجدا وقائما يحذر الآخرة ويرجو رحمة ربه قل هل يستوي الذين يعلمون والذين لا يعلمون إنما يتذكر أول الألباب قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من يريد الله به خيرا يفقه في الدين طلب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم ومسلمة الله سبحانه وتعالى says in the Quran أفمن يعلم أنما أنزل إليك من ربك الحق كمن هو أعمى إنما يتذكر أولو الألباب then he who knows that which has been revealed to you from your Lord is he equal to the one who is blind? They will only be reminded who are people of understanding. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said in the Quran, is the one who is devoutly obedient during periods of the night, prostrating and standing in prayer, fearing the hereafter and hoping for the mercy of his Lord, equal to the one who does not say, الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ are those who know equal to the ones who do not know. الْأَلْبَاب Only they will remember who are people of understanding. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَن يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُوَفِّقْهُ فِي الدِّينِ The one for whom Allah willed goodness, Allah guides him to become a knowledgeable person in the religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him an understanding of deen. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Seeking knowledge is farther on every single Muslim man and Muslim woman. Inshallah, one hadith I would like to read. An Abi Huraira radiallahu anhu qal, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Inna allaha yubghidu kulla ja'adhariyin jawadhin sakhabim bil aswaq. جيفة بالليل حمار بالنهار عالم بأمر الدنيا جاهل بأمر الآخرة رواه ابن حبان. حضرة أبو هريرة رضي الله عنه narrates that Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم said, Allah hates Allah سبحانه وتعالى hates every harsh man who eats excessively, shouts in the bazaar, sleeps at night like a corpse, passes the day works the day throughout the day like a donkey and is well aware of worldly matters but totally ignorant about matters of the hereafter. This hadith is sahih, reported by Ibn Hibban. In this hadith, I would like to focus on the last two lines of this hadith. The last two lines of this hadith, alimim bi amr dunya jahilim bi amr al-akhirah. This hadith is a grave warning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he uses the word yubghidu. Yubghidu, the root word is ghadaba. It means wrath. The wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates the person who is well aware of worldly matters and totally ignorant about matters concerning the hereafter. When we read Surah Fatiha, we say, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِينَ سِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِينَ Guide us to the straight path, the path of those, not the path of those whom you have your wrath upon them, but the path of those, not the path of those who have gone astray, basically. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, His wrath is on those people. So we have to make an effort to learn knowledge of dunya, knowledge of deen, inshallah. We should not be like the ones whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is mentioning in this hadith, who is well aware of worldly matters. It says, Alimim bi amr dunya, who is an alim in the matters of dunya, but a jahil, an ignorant person in the matters of akhirah. The knowledge of dunya, this knowledge is easy to acquire. Since we were little kids, we were trained and we were programmed to live in this life and gain this knowledge of dunya. My little brother, he just started preschool this year. So ever since we're little kids, until we're old, we spend half of our lives pursuing this dunya. This knowledge is being taught everywhere. The universities, the colleges, they're all full of this knowledge. But dunya knowledge is inferior to deen knowledge. The knowledge of deen is harder to acquire than the knowledge of dunya. The knowledge of deen is harder to understand than the knowledge of dunya. When you go inside a university or college, you see everything, the theory is practical. You can see how the structures of buildings form when you're an architect. You can see, you can ask an electrician, what wire goes here, what wire goes there, what's the current? It's very practical, you can see it with your eyes. But dini knowledge, you cannot see. This is ilmul ghaib. Alladheena yu'minuna bil ghaib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this in the Qur'an. Knowledge of the unseen. When the Qur'an, when we say, when the Qur'an says, he talks, in the Qur'an talks about Musa alayhi salam, how he split the ocean. When the Qur'an talks about how Ibrahim alayhi salam was thrown into the fire. When the Qur'an talks about how Isa alayhi salam walked upon water, when the Qur'an speaks about the day of Qiyamah, when the Qur'an speaks about the day of judgment, when the Qur'an speaks about the Qabr, when the Qur'an speaks about Jahannam and Jannah, we cannot see this, my dear respected brothers and sisters. We cannot see this in our eyes. This is called ilmul ghaib, knowledge of the unseen. When we hear this, our hearts are not firm. Like when someone says, if you add helium to a balloon, the balloon will go up. Our hearts begin to shake and waver. One saying, it's a long saying, it was attributed to Hadrat Ali radiallahu anhu in the time of his Khalifa. It's a long hadith, so a long saying, so I'll cut it short. Hadrat Ali radiallahu anhu was asked, what was better, wealth or knowledge? He said, knowledge is superior to wealth for 10 reasons. I will not quote all 10 reasons, but Inshallah. He says, knowledge, knowledge, ilm is a legacy, is a, what the, the inheritance of the ulama, and wealth is an inheritance of the Fir'auns, of the pharaohs. Ali radiallahu anhu said, you have to guard your wealth, but knowledge guards you. He said, a man of wealth has many enemies, while a man of knowledge has many friends. Knowledge is better because it increases with distribution. When you give out knowledge, it increases. But when you give out wealth, it diminishes. Knowledge is better because it cannot be stolen, while wealth it can be stolen. If you know, if you have knowledge, nobody can take that from you. But if you have money, then you always have this constant fear. You have to safeguard it, put it inside a bank. Always keep an eye on it. Knowledge is better because time cannot harm knowledge. But wealth rusts in course of time and wears away. Many of us know this well. Before, when I was small, the dollar used to be such a high value. Now, the value is decreasing and decreasing. But knowledge, knowledge, the authentic knowledge, the sahih knowledge, the knowledge we learn from the old scholars, 
The knowledge we learn from the ulama of deen, this knowledge keeps on increasing in value and increasing in value. Knowledge is better because it is limitless, while wealth, you only have a limit of it. You can keep track of your wealth, but you can never keep track of your knowledge. Knowledge is better because it illuminates the mind, while wealth darkens the mind. Knowledge is better because knowledge, through knowledge, through Iman, the Prophet Sallallahu the Prophets Alayhi Salatu Wasalam and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were able to say, We worship Allah, we worship thee as we are your servants. And this wealth, this wealth confused the minds of the Pharaohs, Pharaoh and Namrud, and they themselves, because of so much wealth, because they thought they were so powerful, and made them say that they were Allah. There were many Sahabas, they strove for knowledge. They strove in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One Sahaba, very famous Sahaba, very young, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave him many responsibilities. His name was Musa'ab ibn Umayr. We know this, we know this youth of Islam. In his early days before Islam, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tears would come into his eyes when he used to tell the early days of Musa'ab ibn Umayr. His parents used to buy him the most expensive clothing, the most expensive jewelry, the most expensive perfumes. When he would walk from one alley to the other alley, people will know this is Musa'ab ibn Umair. He has passed through this valley because of his perfume that he is wearing. Musa'ab ibn Umair, he was the first teacher in Islam. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him to go to Medina and to spread Islam and to teach Islam. When Musa ibn Umair was there, he was teaching and spreading Islam. And some of the chieftains didn't like what he was doing. Some of the chieftains were saying, you are misleading the weak and the poor, and you are brainwashing them into believing your religion. So then when they actually listened to the message of Musa ibn Umair, one Sahabi, Sa'ad bin Ma'az, in the beginning didn't like him teaching Islam. He even pressured the other chieftains to make him stop. But because of Musa'ab's teaching, because of his zeal, because of his devotion, because of his determination, Sa'ad bin Mu'adh, not only did he become Muslim, but he asked his people, O oh people, what do you think of me? His people replied, You are the best and noblest of this clan. And then he replied to his people, O oh people, I will not speak to you until each and every, one, every single one of you accepts Islam. So the entire tribe accepted Islam. Only because of the efforts of one Sahabi, Musa'ab ibn Umayr. I cannot do justice to the life of Musa ibn Umair, but this is just one incident in his life. Back then, not now, but before, it was extremely difficult to get knowledge, to find the authentic sources. The Sahaba, the Tabis, the people who wanted to learn, the scholars, they all used to travel great, great distances to learn knowledge of deen. One incident, one person traveled all the way to Damascus just to learn one hadith. When he was in Damascus, this is narrated by Kathir ibn Qais. I don't know whether he was a Ta'abi or Sahabi. So he said, this person came to Hadrat Abu Darda and he told Ab Hadrat Abu Darda, did Nabi sallallahu, he asked him, did Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam say this hadith? And Hadrat Abu Darda asked him, do you have any other business in Damascus? Do you have any other ulterior motive? Or did you just come solely for the purpose of learning this hadith? He said, I came only f solely for the purpose of learning this hadith. Hadrat Abu Darda radiallahu anhu narrates such a beautiful hadith. I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, Whoever travels on a path in search of knowledge, Allah will enable him to travel on one of the paths to Jannah. And verily the angels, they spread their wings with pleasure for one who seeks knowledge. Indeed, the inhabitants of the skies and the earth and the fish in the depths of the water all supplicate forgiveness for the alim, the Islamic scholar. Verily, the eminence over an alim, over a devout worshiper, is that like the full moon over the stars. And indeed, the ulama are heirs of the prophets. And verily, the prophets did not leave behind as inheritance any dinar nor dirham. Rather, they left ilm as inheritance. So whoever acquired this received an abundant portion. This is a report about Abu Dawood.
Nowadays, we don't have to travel all the way to Damascus for one hadith. Nowadays, we have so much technology. The internet, we have the internet, the libraries, tablets just came out. In Ramadan, a few days ago, Sajjad was showing me someone gifted Mulana Sahib and him about a Quran. This Quran looked like an ordinary Quran, but with the Quran, there was a pen. When you took that pen and you placed it at any part of the Quran, it would automatically know where you're reading. It would automatically start reciting the Quran. Technology has evolved so much, so much, that it's become really easy for us. We have no excuses anymore. We cannot say, I didn't have time, or I couldn't do it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the world is becoming so easy for us to acquire knowledge of deen. There's no more excuses. How do we strive for knowledge, my dear brothers and sisters? In the hadith, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, طَالَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيضَةً عَلَىٰ كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ وَمُسْلِمَةٍ Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Seeking knowledge is fard. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't say anything about acquiring the knowledge. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam only said about seeking the knowledge. In Hadrat Abu, in Imam Abu Hanifa's time, one person asked him, how did you become so knowledgeable? How did you become so great? Imam Abu Hanifa replied, There was two things. If you follow them, one, I was never shy about asking what I didn't know. Nowadays, we feel shy to ask questions. If we ask something we don't know, we'll feel an embarrassment. Maybe someone might say, Oh, you don't know this? You didn't know that? You never learned this when you were small? Even in school, we see the little kids, either by peer pressure or because their teachers, they're making fun of them, their peers would make fun of them, or they will call him nerd or something like that. They wouldn't ask questions just because of this embarrassment. And he also said, whenever anybody asks me something, I never hid anything from them. Without ilm, they say ignorance is bliss, but they also say knowledge is power. Without ilm, there is no ibadah. Without ilm, there is no ibadah. There is no zakah, there is no salah, there is no hajj, there is no Quran. Hajj season is coming up. I heard many stories, I haven't been to hajj, but I heard many stories from people saying when you're trying to kiss the black stone, it's almost impossible. People are punching each other, fighting each other, just so they can kiss the black stone. But do we know, brothers and sisters, that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, harming another Muslim brother, harming another Muslim sister is haram. And we are doing this, we are harming the Muslim brother, we are harming the Muslim sister, just so we can kiss the black stone, which is only a sunnah. So we should not commit haram just to, commit, just to practice a sunnah. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu says, He's addressing the Kaaba. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has elevated the status of you in front of the eyes of the Muslims. He has elevated the status of you so high in this world. And then he said, but the status of a Muslim, the status of a mu'min is higher than you because you were made for the mu'min. Without ilm, we don't have any motivation. Without ilm, there is no desire to perform a deed or perform an action. Without ilm, one thing is to say subhanallah. If I'm telling someone to say subhanallah, but if I tell someone to say subhanallah, it's not the same as me telling him, say subhanallah, because Allah will grant you a tree in Jannah. This tree is so huge, this tree is so majestic, that a rider will ride on a fast Arabian horse for over a hundred years, and he still will not be able to cross that tree. When we know ilm, when we know why we do our ibadah, when we know what rewards we'll get, if we pray salah, when we know what rewards we'll get if we give zakah, when we know what rewards we'll get when we read Quran, also if we know what harm will happen if we miss our salah, what harm will happen if we do not perform our good deeds, then following them will become easy. We will have a desire to follow the deen. There will be no block, there will be no, there will always be a desire. We do need dunya knowledge, yes. But we already lived our entire life on dunya knowledge. Most of us, we spent our entire lives in school. 
I just finished high school, alhamdulillah. But Dini knowledge is much superior. One sheikh from South Africa, his name is Suleiman Khatani, one of the most prominent sheikhs in South Africa. Someone gave me a CD. May Allah give him Jannah, inshallah. One quote, he said, Nowadays, man, more or less to the meaning, the quote was, Man has to study. Man has to study and has to study. Why does he have to study? So he can get a good degree. Why does he have to get a good degree? So he can get a good job. Why does he have to get a good job? So he can get a good salary. Why does he have to give a good salary? So he can provide a good life for his wife and children. So he can buy a big house. So he can buy nice cars. So that his children can also attain that same education. So his children can study. So his children can study to get a degree. So his children can study to get a good job. So his children can study to get a good salary. So his children can study to provide for his kids. And his kids can study to get a good salary. Astaghfirullah. This is, chain is going to go on forever and ever. But we have to change the chain. We have to increase our dini knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we do not want to, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need us to gain dini knowledge, my dear respected brothers and sisters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a hadith Qudsi, even if the first of you until the last of you were to gather together and you became the most pious of my slaves, the most obedient to me, it would not increase my kingdom a bit. And even if you were the most wicked of slaves from the beginning of Adam alayhi salam to the end of time, it would not decrease my kingdom in the least. If all of you from the beginning of Adam alayhi salam to the end of creation were to gather and each one of you were to ask me what his heart desires, and I were to give you all what you desire, it would not decrease my kingdom, even as to the extent as if you take a drop out of the ocean. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so great. It's not as if I am memorizing this, or I'm becoming a hafiz, or I'm learning the Quran, so I'm doing a favor to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Astaghfirullah, my dear respected brothers and sisters. If Allah ta'ala, if He gives us it is a blessing if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us hidayah to learn. It is a blessing if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to do His worship. So inshallah, everybody should make full effort for seeking knowledge. We should try to look for scholars in our locality. Always try to find out where we can seek knowledge. It doesn't matter who is giving the knowledge. Maybe we do, not, we do not like some sheikh because his beard is too small. Maybe we do not like the university he graduated from. Maybe he's very rich, so we think something of him. But just because of one small thing, you cannot deprive yourself of everything that sheikh has to offer. One story to prove this, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, one sahaba, he was in charge of the zakat of Ramadan. And one man at nighttime, he came and took zakat, and he caught the Sahabi caught that man, and he told the man, "Why are you stealing the zakat?" And the man said, "I am needy. I am poor. My family is starving. Please have mercy on me." So he, the man let him go. The next day, Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked the Sahaba, "What did you do with your prisoner last night?" And the Sahaba said, "He complained of needs and wants for his family. So I let him go." This happened twice, and it happened a third time. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa told the sahaba that this man is a liar. Next time, do not let him go. This happened twice, and then it happened the third time. And the third time, the sahaba said, I will not let you go. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa has strictly informed me that you are a liar. And then this, the man said, if you let me go, I shall give you an advice. He said, if you read Ayatul Qursi before you go to bed, then no shaitan will come near you. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when the sahaba told Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he told him that man was speaking the truth, even though he is a great liar. And then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam asked the man, do you know who this person was, who was your companion for the last three nights? The man said, no. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam replied, he was shaitan. So you see, even shaitan, even the worst, even our enemy, he gives us advice. So we should try to take advice from everybody, inshallah. There are many, many scholars who want to teach us deen, who want to get blessings, 
but there's no students for them. Inshallah, we should try to go and seek out the circles of dhikr, the circles of knowledge. I'll finish with one last example. The example is if we buy one car, with the car we have a manual. The manual says we have to put gas in the gas tank. We have to put water where it's supposed to go. If we don't follow the manual and if we live life just like how everybody else lives life and we don't follow it, and we put milk inside the gas tank, and if we put gas where the water is supposed to be, then the car will be messed up. There is no more guarantee. There is no more guarantee from the manufacturer that this car will last certain, certain years. Same way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has made us the Qur'an, He gave us the Qur'an as a guide. So inshallah, brothers and sisters, we should use this Qur'an as our guide. If we do not use this Qur'an as our guide, just like the car, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give any guarantee that we will be on the right path. So inshallah, has everybody, everybody has intention for this? Jazakallah. إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ورسولك وصل على المؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات وبارك على محمد وأزواجه وذريته قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أرحم أمتي بأمتي أبو بكر وأشدهم في أمر الله عمر وأصدقهم حياء عثمان وأقضاهم علي وفاطمة سيدة نساء أهل الجنة والحسن والحسين سيدا شباب أهل الجنة وهمزة أسد الله وأسد رسوله اللهم اغفر للعباس وولده مغفرة ظاهرة وباطنة لا تغادر ذنبا الله 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 في أصحابي لا تتخذوهم غرضا من بعدي فمن أحبهم فبحبي أحبهم ومن أبغضهم فببغضي أبغضهم وخير أمتي قرني ثم الذين يلونهم ثم الذين يلونهم وسلطان ذل الله في الأرض من أهان سلطان الله في الأرض أهانه الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعدكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروني يذكركم واشكروا لي ولا تكفرون أقيم الصلاة Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar.